The River Severn flows down through the Shropshire Plain, through the narrow Iron Bridge Gorge and out into the rolling land of Worcestershire. And here it meets its first city, Worcester. Its combination of ancient buildings, a lovely waterside setting and rich history put Worcester high on anyone's list of desirable places to spend a day out. And I think a visit here would be well rewarded. The quay where the boats tie up is exactly like a small harbour. From here, boats ply downstream to Tewkesbury and Gloucester and upstream to Starport. Worcester was a port for many centuries and is still in a small way. At the Diglis Basin downstream from here about half a mile, the Worcester to Birmingham Canal branches off the river. And the quay here does a brisk trade in summertime, offering river trips to the tourist or riverboat shuffles with bar attached to the customer who likes to take a pint or two of ale with his relaxation. One of the nicest ways of getting to know the city is to stroll downstream along the towpath to the cathedral. This is not only the cathedral wall, it's also part of the old city wall. At one time the river came right up to it and it wasn't possible to walk along here at all. The towpath which they tried to lay was constantly being taken away by river floods. But eventually the problem was overcome. They sank a row of old river barges or troughs laden with stones and covered them up with concrete. At the far end of the wall there's this ancient water gate. This led down from the monastery and from here there used to be a ferry across the river. What's interesting about this water gate however is that you can see a record of the great floods which have taken place over the years. Up there you can see the level it reached in 1886 and then in March 1947 it was that high. There was one great event, however, which for the fishermen concerned was probably the memory of a lifetime. In 1843, at Diglis Draft, where salmon were netted, a sturgeon was caught in the Severn. Yes, that's right, a sturgeon, the one that caviar comes from. The catch was so unusual that the fishermen carved the outline of the fish in the wall behind the water gate. And here it is. There's the head. And following the line cut into the stone, here, eight feet away, is the tail. In case you think it's a tall tail, the original fish was stuffed and resides in the museum. The Cathedral of St Mary is the towering centre of Worcester. It's associated with two English saints, Oswald, who was bishop here in the 10th century, and Woolston, his successor of a century later. Wollstone rebuilt the cathedral in 1092 and after his death it was rededicated to St Mary, St Peter and the Holy Confessors Oswald and Dunstan. The cathedral housed shrines to the two local saints so pilgrims would come from far and wide to visit them. The cathedral suffered during the Civil War when only the nave was used for preaching. While the war was raging the parliamentary forces stabled their horses in the cathedral and in general caused a lot of damage. King John's tomb with its effigy dates from 1230. It's said that in his will he asked to be buried between the shrines of Saints Oswald and Woolston, which stood on either side of the chancel. The idea was that on the day of judgment he would stand bathed in the reflected glory of those saints and wouldn't look quite so bad. Whether that's true or not, the legend also says that in his will he asked to be buried in a monk's habit. When the tomb was opened about 200 years ago, sure enough, the remains were found to be clad in a cowl and habit. The cathedral is one of the homes of the Three Choirs Festival, the others being Gloucester and Hereford cathedrals. It's the oldest festival in Europe, and it was only to be expected that Worcester's great man of music, Sir Edward Elgar, was very much involved with it. And there's a window commemorating his oratorio, The Dream of Gerontius.
In the shadow of the cathedral is the old palace, one of the original residences of the bishops of Worcester. Nowadays, the bishop lives at Hartlebury Castle, and this building houses the offices of the diocese. But visitors who make arrangements may come and have a look around. The most remarkable room is the Great Hall, where Elizabeth I held court, and where in 1980, the second Queen Elizabeth came with the Prince of Wales. She'd been distributing Maundy money at the cathedral, and it was here that she met the bishop and his staff. In 1780, King George III stayed here when he visited the Three Choirs Festival. He was given to nocturnal rambling, and it's said that one night he climbed down from his bedroom window and was found wandering at 5 a.m. in his nightshirt. Not far away from the palace is another ecclesiastical relic, the Spire of St Andrews. In 1947, the church was declared redundant, but there was such a public outcry at the loss of this much-loved landmark that the spire was reprieved, and here it stands. It's called the Glover's Needle, because glove-making was one of the principal trades. At one time, there were 30,000 glove-makers here. If you bought gloves anywhere in England, you could be pretty sure that someone in Worcester had had a hand in it. It's amazing the number of strange things that have taken place at the top of the spire. It seems that whenever repair jobs had to be done, people took advantage of the scaffolding or the steeplejacks ladders to do things up there. A barber once shaved several customers. A wine merchant and a local editor shared a bottle of fine port. And once, a china painter even decorated a tiny cup right up at the summit. Leading away to the north of the cathedral is the High Street, once the main thoroughfare through the city. It's been pedestrianised recently and it gives you a chance to get away from the traffic which flows ceaselessly past the cathedral on its way to the bridge. One of the most distinguished buildings along the High Street is the Guildhall. It housed many aspects of Worcester life, being a centre for administration, justice, entertainment and sport. The original building was a timber-framed structure and it contained two courts of law, a prison and a hall where plays were performed. They also played real tennis in the hall and when a citizen became a member of the corporation he was required to pay a fee of 16 shillings and 8 pence towards the glass windows. The present building was designed by Thomas White, a sculptor who sprinkled it with effigies. Charles I, Charles II with his church and Queen Anne. There are also symbols of labour, peace, justice and plenty, and chastisement. And local legend says that the stone head over the door is supposed to be Oliver Cromwell with his ears pinned back. Inside the Guild Hall you can see different objects which the city's acquired over the years. There's a couple of cannons, this one from the Civil War, and various weapons associated with that period. The town of Worcester simply bristles with royal connections and because of its traditional and age-long loyalty to the crown, it's not surprising that monarchs down the centuries have popped in for a right royal welcome. This is Queen Elizabeth's house in the Trinity and it's from here, according to tradition, that Queen Elizabeth I addressed the citizens of Worcester when she visited the city in 1575. It's one of those Queen Elizabeth slept here type stories, which sounds cosy, but is more rooted in folklore than in fact. Incidentally, when the roads around here were widened 90 years ago, the house was simply jacked up onto rails and moved sideways 30 feet to its present position. No town the size of Worcester would be complete without its market and this is where a lot of the buying and selling was done. It's called Mealcheapen Street. Cheap was an old name for market, and the commodity here was grain. Down here, the Reindeer Hotel had a large storehouse for corn, as did many of the old inns in the neighborhood. The farmers would bring their produce to market and store it here, and then stay until it was sold. On one side of the corn market at the end of Mealcheapen Street was this 16th century wool merchant's house. After the Battle of Worcester, Charles II took refuge in the house, hiding from the parliamentary forces. 
When the soldiers came to the front door of the house in New Street, the king made his escape from the door at the other end of the house and out through an alley door to the city wall. King Charles House, as it's called, stands at the north end of New Street. At its southern end, New Street becomes Friar Street, the city's most interesting medieval thoroughfare. The fact that it still contains so much of its historical character, when so many old streets have been pulled down, is thanks largely to a Mr. Matley Moore, who saved the Greyfriars building here on the right. It had been neglected so much that part of it collapsed in the street. His reconstruction in the 1940s made people realise what a rich heritage there was in Friar Street, and so it escaped the worst of the redevelopment. The Greyfriars building itself is now a private house, but it's possible to walk up the small entry and gaze over the gate at the delightful garden which nestles behind the old building. Just along Friar Street you'll find Tudor House. For many years it was the Cross Keys Inn, but now it's been converted into a museum of social and domestic life of Worcester. It has an unusual detail, this hagioscope or squint, a hole through which you could observe a small section of what was going on in the room next door. This sort of peephole was usually found in churches or chapels so that the nobility could attend the services without having to mix with the hoi polloi. But the man who knows more about the museum is Brian Owen. Brian, you're the keeper of the collection here. What sort of items do you include? Well, Tudor House contains the major part of the social history collections of the museum service. And here you'll find displays related to local, domestic and working life. This is obviously something to do with agriculture, isn't it? It's That's right. This is, this is part of our agricultural display. It's a seed fiddle which um, was introduced during the last half of, last, of the last century um, as an advance over broadcasting seed by hand. Um, in this device, the seed was placed in this canvas bag and from there it fell through onto this rotor which could be operated by the stick there with an action very similar to uh, a violin. Um, these were made right up until the last war at least. Hmm. What about this one over here? That obviously saved a lot of back breaking, didn't it, for the farmer? That's right, yes. Um, well, what's this beautiful piece of uh, blue machinery here? Well, this again is a seed sowing device. It's a single row pea or bean barrow. Um, would have been used on a small holding and um, the farmer would either push it along like a wheelbarrow or could just guide it while it was pulled by a pony. The idea was that the seed was held in the blue box and um, was guided down the funnel at the back into a furrow which the machine also made by a system of brushes inside the box which were operated by this clutch mechanism there. When would this sort of agricultural development have been introduced, Brian? Probably at the end of the 18th century, but um, it was very long-lived and uh, things like this were still in use up until the 1930s. Uh, you mentioned earlier on that you have domestic appliances here. I'd like mm -hmm. to have a look at those. Any chance? Right, certainly. Apart from Victorian and Edwardian domestic appliances, Tudor House has also got a collection of um, 1920s and 30s equipment, and some of these are displayed here, like the, uh, the pressure cooker there. That looks pretty lethal. It does look lethal, but uh, apparently they were quite efficient and did the job well. Um, that particular model was introduced during the middle 1920s. The cooker underneath? The cooker underneath is an electric stove, um, the Jackson, which was uh, fitted into Worcester Council houses built during the 1930s. And pretty colourful too. That's right. These pastel shades were coming in during the uh, early 1930s, replacing the black, which was the, uh, the universal colour for cooking equipment prior to that date. Bigger cooker over here. Now, what's this one, Brian? That's the gas equivalent of the Jackson, a middle 30s um, New World stove operated by gas. Um, it's got a neat little oven there and uh, three rings on top and uh, there is an iron which um, could be plugged into a socket on a the gas side. Iron. A gas iron, yes, mm. yes. What about the washing machine here? This is <laughs> pretty ancient looking. Again, 1930s? 
Yes, patented in 1933. This is the Acme gas washing machine. Um, the gas heated the water, and um, the, the agitation of the water plus the ringing still had to be carried out by hand. But nevertheless, uh, some of the hard work was being taken out of uh, It was, yes, the yes, by the application of gas and electricity, but um, the spin dry was still very much a thing of the future. When you acquire objects for the museum, Brian, what sort of state are they in? Are they generally in uh, a pretty good working order? Quite often they are, but sometimes a good deal of work is required to make them displayable. Uh, we usually have a restoration project underway, and this summer we've been working on a locally built farm cart, which is nearing completion here. How old is that? It was made in 1927. Have you had to do a lot of work on it? A fair amount of work on this one, yes. Um, the object being to keep as much of the original fabric as is possible and um, make replacement parts just where it's absolutely necessary. Friar Street was also the birthplace of a remarkable woman, the soldier Hannah Snell. Born in 1720, she was the daughter of a hosier. As a child, she was something of a tomboy, always dressing up and playing soldiers. As a young woman, she was deserted by her soldier husband, so she disguised herself as a man and travelled to Coventry, hoping to find him. When she failed, she enlisted in the Duke of Northumberland's army, marching with them to Carlisle, where she deserted. She travelled to Portsmouth, where she joined the Marines, and then in India took part in the siege of Pondicherry. Although wounded in the groin, she managed to conceal the secret of her sex by removing the bullet herself and dressing the wound. After her exploit had become famous, she kept a public house in London called the Female Warrior. But the pub was not a success, and the King granted her a shilling a day as an out-pensioner of Chelsea Hospital. When she died in 1792, she was buried in the grounds of the hospital. At the end of Friar Street, you find yourself in Sidbury, which was the road leading to one of Worcester's old city gates. Just outside the walls, when they stood, was where this building, called the Commandery, was built. It was founded by Bishop Woolston in the 11th century as a refuge for wayfarers locked out of the city by night. The building stands back from the main road, so it's nice and quiet here, but in 1651 the scene was far from tranquil. The building was at the heart of the Battle of Worcester, enclosed by earthworks, which ran from the bastion of Fort Royal up on the hill down to Sidbury Gate. Cromwell had captured Fort Royal and turned the guns on the city, and during the battle the Duke of Hamilton was very badly injured. After refusing surgery, he died here in the commandery. Nowadays, the commandery is yet another of the ancient buildings of Worcester which is open to the public, and it's a lovely, tranquil place to sit and take tea where once the air was thick with shot and shell. The outpost I mentioned earlier is just a few hundred yards up the hill from the commandery, and this is it. In 1651, Fort Royal was a fortified earthwork on high ground from where the Royalist troops could bombard Cromwell's troops at their fortified position, which was further out. During the battle, the King and the Duke of Hamilton led an attack on the parliamentary infantry, and their charge was successful, causing chaos in the ranks. But Cromwell arrived at that moment, bravely rallied his forces and led a counter-attack. The Royalists were driven off, and then for some hours, Cromwell's troops attacked the force holding this point here at Fort Royal. It was finally taken and the guns were turned on the city, with the result that the parliamentarians won the day and King Charles II became a fugitive. We've come down from Fort Royal now and back towards the cathedral. If you turn off the main road as it approaches the cathedral, you're confronted by the Edgar Tower. It gets its name from the statue of King Edgar, crowned in 973. Until about a hundred years ago, it used to be called St Mary's Gate. It was the main gate to the royal castle and priory. It was built after one of Worcester's many disastrous fires in 1202. King John ordered the sheriff of Worcester to acquire the best wood and stone and rebuild the gatehouse. These doors are the ones that King John ordered, and they're still working. Let's see, 1202, that makes these gates 780 years old. Hmm, 
I don't build them like that anymore. When you come through the Edgar Tower, you come into this quiet, peaceful area. On the one side, there's the cathedral and the cloisters, and on the other, the King's School. It was in this area that the ancient monastery had its Geston House. It was built in the 14th century, and very fine it was too, or so we're told. We've no way of knowing, because in 1862, the Dean and Chapter decided that they couldn't afford the £1,000 or so which was required to put the old building to rights. So they voted to pull it down, and that they did with great dispatch. This act of vandalism caused a great outcry among local antiquarians. Indeed, one of them, a Mr J.H. Parker, wrote to the gentleman's magazine bus that someone was anxious to get the old hall out of the way before a certain time was evident by the men being employed day and night to pull it down as soon as the fiat had been issued. And this one wall is all that remains of the Geston Hall, at least not quite all. The roof was saved and moved to a church elsewhere in the city and in recent times it's found a permanent home at the Avoncroft Museum of Buildings near Bromsgrove. Not far away from the cathedral is one of the industries, or should I say institutions, which have made Worcester a household name all over the world. It's the Royal Worcester Porcelain Factory, founded in 1751 to make china in England of a quality to compare with that being imported from China. Over the years, the Royal Worcester companies produced some of the most beautiful porcelain in the world. And it's our good fortune that many of the finest pieces are preserved in the Dyson Perrin Museum, here at the factory. The curator of the museum is Henry Sandon, and I asked him how he felt Royal Worcester compared with the great names of European porcelain, like Meissen and Sèvres. Well, Worcester was, uh, at first, never a, a royal manufactory like those two great European factories. It didn't matter if those factories made a, a whacking financial loss. It was a sign of kind of a status symbol for the country. Worcester had to make a profit to satisfy their original shareholders. So they had to be a bit... They managed to survive, whereas all the other great English names uh, went down the, the swanee. Why, why was the factory set up here in Worcester particularly? Uh, we're not really quite sure. Uh, there's no suitable clay, stone or fuel in the town and I suppose the reason why they set up was the fact that the River Severn brought the raw materials here and would take the finished products down to Bristol or, and ship them around the world. Obviously you must have some very interesting pieces here in the museum and some marvellous stories connected with them. Oh yes, the fact is the, the museum is, is full of fantastic pieces. Um, one of the most important ones perhaps is the, is the first pot made at the factory. I brought it out of the case very carefully to, uh, to show it to you. It's, it's uh, called the Wigornia Cream Boat after the little inscription uh, Wigornia under the base. Uh, and um, it's the first piece made at the factory in 1751, very much in the style of the Chinese, of course, aping the Chinese production and style. And uh, we had to buy this uh, some years ago for a world's record price of £20,000 to get it back to our museum. So that was, that was made before Royal Worcester developed its own style? Yes, it's imitating the Oriental styles. But um, moving into the period after Worcester got its first raw warrant in 1789, from George III, uh, of course they started producing for the English nobility in more in the English style. This is um, perhaps a, a typical case in point, uh, 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 part of a service made for Admiral Nelson who visited the factory here when he came to Worcester to get the freedom of the city in 1802. That's very beautiful. Is it part of a dinner service? Uh, no, this is a breakfast service. Actually, the Admiral ordered a breakfast dinner and dessert equipage, an enormous order, uh, but um, only the breakfast service seems to have been produced. Uh, we feel nowadays that it was uh, only the breakfast service made because they couldn't get the money out of Nelson <laughs> while he was alive, uh, and he only paid for it uh, when, when he, after he was died, uh, his executors. Uh, produced the payment in 1806. Oh, that's a lovely story. Uh, what about the, uh, the artists who were involved in working here in the factory? Because they're all so beautifully painted. You must have had some great characters. There have been some great characters indeed. I, I suppose one thing particularly about the Stinton family, they, they, 
was Worcester was Worcester Cathedral or Worcester Sauce. There were uh, five great generations of them uh, led to John Stinton, this, uh, the painter of the Highland cattle scenes. Oh, yes. Uh, he, he produced superb Highland cattle scenes over a period of about 80 years of working here. Lived to be 102 with a grand old man and painted so much Highland cattle that the workers on the factory said he grew to look like a Highland beast. <laughs> uh, the peculiar thing was that he'd never been to Scotland once in his life. Uh, his son told me he never went further north than Droitwich. It always puzzled me how he did these gorgeous scenes like this. He just had to thing about Highland cattle. He, he loved Highland cattle. The big problem was he'd never even seen a Highland cattle at all. And uh, he was worried that he would get the feet wrong. So he, he never depicted the feet on his paintings. Always hid them down in the grasses or the water. What sort of apprenticeship would somebody like that have had to serve? They usually served a, a seven-year articled apprentice. Um, but then, of course, they were always learning, continually learning. One of the most incredible craftsmen really only developed his unique style uh, after being here about 70 years, when he developed the ability to do these extraordinary pierced wares. Um, this is the work of a, a fantastic man called George Owen, who could pierce clay while it was in a wet state uh, without any pattern on it whatsoever, cutting it out with a little knife a small little chunk after chunk uh, and produce these incredible pots. That, uh, that is quite beautiful. So something like that really is a one-off. It's a one-off piece. This vase actually was made for the Great Chicago Exhibition of 1893, but his uh, normal production is just as beautiful as that. And we have some magnificent examples of his work in the factory here. But uh, a very canny craftsman who never let anybody into his room to see him working. So to this day, we don't really know quite how he did his, his skills. And what about something a little more up to date? Well, I've, I've got here the, one of the most recent pieces produced by the factory, uh, the, the bust of uh, the Princess of Wales. Uh, I suppose you've got, um, uh, on the pieces I've showed here, uh, 200 and... 30-odd years of, of, of factory production between yeah. the two. Well, that's just a brief glimpse of this right royal city. If you choose to walk further around the town, you can visit the beautiful county cricket ground or the race course about half a mile upstream. Worcester's handy for the M5 motorway, only half an hour from Birmingham. Rail communications are good too, and if you come by car, there's the splendid countryside of the Vales in touring distance from Worcester. But as for me, I leave the city as I arrived, by boat. <laughs>